we are live. Come on, people. I see two people there. Welcome, three. Hello, Tanya Hunter. How are you? I hope you're excited as I am. Who else is on board? If you like, or you can lurk in the shadows if you like. I guarantee you the word will still get to you. All right, it's exactly five o'clock now. I'm going to wait two minutes and I'm going to get started with our content, starting with introducing myself. I'm really looking forward to this. First time that I've ever done anything like this before. And I think it's an excellent medium for getting God's word across to the masses. Four people now. Linda. Hey, Linda Helton. How you doing, girlfriend? Thank you for your support. Hey, how you doing, Zandra? Zandra, thank you so much for this opportunity. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let me start out by introducing myself. My name is Joanne. I've been married about eight weeks now, and my last name is Sims now, S-I-M-S, -S, Joanne Sims. And I was invited by um, Zandra Wilson to assist her in putting these classes out for single women. And it just spoke to me, and I felt that it's really something that I should be doing. So a uh, little bit about me. I am 62 years old. Lived all the lifestyles. I've been a single parent at 19 years old. I've gotten married. I've got divorced. Uh, after nine years, I got married again. And that, and that husband and me, we were married for 17 years and he passed away. And then I was by myself about nine more years and I recently got married again. Totally nothing on my radar. It uh, just came out of the blue and here we are, we're married. But uh, one thing that I can say, out of each one of those relationships, I am a different woman. And I've learned more and more about myself, especially as I've gotten older, about how to relate to a man, which is kind of secondary, but primarily I've learned how to relate to God. And I think that I've you know, I have not arrived because I won't arrive until Jesus comes, but I've arrived in the sense where I understand more than I did before. So I'm so happy to share some of my insights with you. So um, I'm going to be teaching, I think, three classes. And this is the first one, the qualifications of a godly out online. Hopefully you had a chance to download it. If not, you can get it after I'm done talking. And feel free to type in your comments and, and, and let's just have some good dialogue. All right, let me kind of go through the 10 things we're going to be talking about tonight. Demonstrating, number one, is demonstrating an intimate familiarity with God's Word. Number two is resonate a calm and quietness of spirit. Number three is being grounded in courage and strength. And number four, be relentless in prayer and intercession. 
Number five, be generous in resources. Number six, impart wise advice, which is what I'm hoping I'm doing tonight. Confess your uh, number eight, exercise lightheartedness and good humor. Uh, number nine, be driven to complete tasks thoroughly. And number 10, forgive as easily as you have been forgiven. So these things, I think, are not necessarily part of, uh, of getting married. You know, I kind of like what Zandra did. She wants us to understand ourselves first before we can move into the marriage arena. But let's just say for the sake of this lesson that everything we've learned about being a woman of God, no, everything we've learned about being a woman is incorrect. You know, even going way back to the beginning of Adam and Eve, you know, when you look at Adam and Eve's situation, when they were when they, oh, the reception's breaking up. Okay. Anybody else having problems hearing me? Okay, Sandra, that, hopefully that's just your issue. Ah, okay. Well, I don't know. I'm doing good over here. Bear with me. Okay. So let's just say everything that we learned about being a woman was wrong. Stop restart and hear about what God has for us. What does it mean to be a woman in Christ? If you go back to the time of Adam and Eve, you know, when when Eve led Adam to eat to to eat the apple, a curse was was pronounced on women. And after that, when the woman was subject to her man, which leads me to believe that prior to that, it was a pretty 50-50 equal relationship. But because of his downfall, it put us where we are. And also, I think it left us with the ability to be deceived easier than it is for males to be deceived. So I think we have to look at what we do and what we are as women and who we are as women and really examine that. I know when we look at shows like The Housewives of Atlanta, The Housewives of, the Housewives of Potomac, you know, we see that lingo now throughout all of our culture. And is that really what it means to be a woman? You know, to snapping your fingers and you know what, you know how we do it. Is that what God wants for us? I don't believe so. So I think that going through these 10 characteristics is really going to help us out. And so it's 10 of them. And I have an hour to get it done with. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So number one, demonstrating a familiarity with God's word. Now, what does that mean? That means that we should understand his word. Now, how are we going to understand his word? The only way we're going to achieve that is by study of his word. And I only just study it. I remember being a teenager and in the angst of puberty, you know, struggling and trying to read the Bible to get some relief and understand what was going on. But I wasn't really saved then. I did not have the Holy Spirit there to help me understand. Um, I can testify that the more Bible study you're in, the more you understand God and the more you Spirit is going to be with you. So as a godly woman, we should be very familiar with what the word says. Whenever there's something that's coming up, you know, whenever I have a, a misunderstanding about something and I want to understand it, everything is in the Bible. My former pastor, Solomon Drake, used to say, Every answer to every circumstance in life can be found in God's word. And that is so true. It is. But you cannot understand it. You cannot understand it if you don't read it. It can't jump into your head. So you have to place a priority on study. You have to place a priority on prayer. Just like some of you have weekly hair appointments. Um, you have biweekly nail appointments, and we don't miss that for anything, you know, because, you know, we got to keep the nails together. So we need to set aside some time where we're going to have some earnest study of the word. My day is Monday. My husband knows that when I get up early on Monday morning, that that is the time that I'm going to go in the office, open up the word, and study. Throughout the day, 
I mean, throughout the day and throughout the week, I listen to a, a Bible app called Daily Audio Bible, where this guy, Brian, is just reading the word of God. And I have listened from Genesis all the way to First Chronicles right now, just listening to it. And I find it that keeps the word before me daily. But if you're going to church once a week, and you think that that's going to be enough to carry you through, you are sadly mistaken. That's why by Wednesday and Thursday, you're poor in heart. That's why you can't make it. That's why you're mad in the parking lot after you left church. So you have to put some priority and some consistency with your Bible study, because that is the only thing that if you look at it this way, you're saved, you're set apart. There is a process set up for you by God whereby you can be strengthened, you can be assisted, everything can go right for you. He is ready to direct your steps every step of the way. But when we don't put him first, when we don't put his word first, and we don't seek to understand what he is telling us, and this is how we get messages through his word. So a godly woman is very familiar with the word of God. You know, and, and like I said, it's more than Sunday. It's more than going Bible study because, you know, even with going to Bible study weekly, when do you get the best inspiration? You get it by your own personal Bible study. That's when the spirit of God gets a chance to minister to you and tell you things that is revelation for you. You know, and then once you get into this rhythm of things, the spirit is with you all the time. I went um, I went um, somewhere yet last night. I went to a wedding last night and I was kind of looking at the people at the wedding and I could clearly see there was a uh, there was, say, a Christian group and there was a non-Christian group, you know, and, and just. To be able to pick that up, I don't accredit it to myself. I accredit that to the Holy Spirit being in me so I can see. So he will allow non-Christian wheat and the tares are going to grow up together. But it's not our problem. Our job is just to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable, knowledgeable about him and be able to use that word to help ourselves and to help each other. Because when you look at the the um, when you look at the community of believers, when you look at what is happening, where this system is set up that we have everything we need within the community of Christ. We have forgiveness. We have people around us that can lift us up. We have people around us that can inspire us. All of that is set apart, of, uh, set apart for us. But if we don't study his word, we are not going to know what to do. Now, the second thing is resonating a calm and quietness of spirit. I think that if we... Watch what's happening in television. When we look at the basketball wise, and we look at the Atlanta housewives, and we look at actually all of the housewives on Bravo, do you see calmness and quietness of spirit? When you have a woman that is calm, sorry, it's hot here in LA. Uh, when you have a woman that is calm and that is quiet, who doesn't have to say what's on her mind all the time, it takes confidence for that, because if you know who you are in Christ, you don't have to say anything. Do you know that it's OK not to give an answer? Do you know it's OK that if you don't have to give an answer, you can just let it go and let God fight your battles? That's one thing I'm learning, you know, being married. Sometimes, you know, things will go down and I want things to happen in a certain manner. But my husband is not not my husband is not agreeing with me on it a hundred percent. But I've God will jump in there and He will fight that battle for me, and I won't have to do anything. If you look at James chapter one verse nineteen, it says, "So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear." slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
you don't have to say anything. Wisdom and your your the, the, the God that is in you, the spirit of God is going to scream for you. I, I've had people that tell me that, you know, Joanne, man, when you walk into the room, it's just like you're you just have this aura about you. You're just you're just glowing. Well, I know it's not me and I know what they're seeing. They're seeing the peace of God. They're seeing the confidence that's in me, knowing that I don't have to fix everything. And I wasn't always like that. I was a type one girl, type A girl. I mean, everything had to be right all the time. And if it wasn't, it bothered me. And I still struggle with it. My husband tells me all the time, honey, don't worry about it. Just calm down. But I'm doing much better with it. So let every woman be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now, can you imagine how, how that would look in a relationship? Can you imagine how that would look while you're in the mall and the sales girl is really slow? Or if you're in the restaurant, you don't have to always, as they say on TV, clap back and tell somebody off and tell them your mind. You just walk away. Now, is it easy? No, it's not easy at all. You only can accomplish these things with the spirit of God. So, like I said, you don't always have to have a response. And it's okay that you don't get your way. You have to let Jesus speak for you. So where I am quiet and where I am sitting back, God is speaking for me. And that's my assurance. Okay. So I don't have to say anything. I can just walk on. So when you see me, that's the glow that you see about me. All right. Let's look at 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5. Now, this set of scriptures, yeah, I'm still trying not to cringe too hard, but it's something important in this. So 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5 says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of, your, of their wives. Why? Because their wives are demonstrating this quiet spirit. This quiet spirit when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And when, when it, your husband, but you understand the bigger picture. All right. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold or pulling on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden in the person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You know, I've heard guys say that, you know, the woman might be beautiful on the outside, but she's ugly on the inside. You know, so, I mean, we're worried about the fact that we're not thin or we're not this, and we don't have long hair and all this kind of stuff, but it's really not the outside that matters. And, and a mate or, or a man that's looking for you is going to be looking at that inside. So you need to check yourself out. Are your nails done, but your spirit is hard? Is your hair sharp, laid to the side? What is it? Dyed, fried, and laid to the side, but you got a filthy mouth. So we're backwards. We need to reverse how we see ourselves as women and understanding that it is not the adornment of the outside. Now, don't, keep, don't, don't get it. And that my that my inside is right better than my outside because that is the thing that speaks for me that is the thing that's going to get me through the day get me through this life that God can use me so yes I can look good on the outside but I'm really looking for my beauty that's on the inside um, the next one being gr be grounded in courage and in strength now, you know, we as, you know, I don't know if I have any viewers out here that are not African-American women, but for African-American women, we have this thing we call the, the strong black woman. And, you know, when I was uh, younger, I used to say, you know, whenever I couldn't get something done my way, I'm going to go into black woman mode, meaning that I'm going to get this done. But the picking us because, you know, we don't do anything on our own and, and there is, we have no strength on our own and everything that happens to us is because God has done it. So, you know, we, we get fooled. That's why when we get a mate, 
we run them away because we so busy trying to be strong and we so busy trying to be right. And we might be right, but it is not for me to say. It is for God to do it. I have to understand that I don't have any courage and strength on my own. I can't do anything. If it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't be sitting up here in this house. I wouldn't be sitting here with any belong. I, I wouldn't have anything understanding that I cannot do it by myself. What did he tell Joshua? Joshua 1.9. It sa he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever I go. Wherever I go. Wherever you go, God is with you. So we don't have to worry. If we are in the right place at the right time, following the right God, what do I have to be concerned about? And you know, he wants us to, he wants us to depend on him. He wants us to lean on him. The more that I subtract myself, the greater he Say, hey, Lord, whatever, you know, I'm trying to stay out of his business because he has a way of doing things. And, you know, he has a plan of doing things. I, I had a situation and um, I, I, I knew what I wanted and I knew how I could make it happen. But the Lord was telling me to stand down. He said, don't do that. You know, he says, well, do you have a better plan than me? No, Lord, I don't have a better plan than you. So what is my job during this? Just to sit back. And he's going to give me the courage and the strength that I need to walk through whatever I walk through. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. And again, I say, if you are in his purpose, that is the most confident feeling that you could ever have. You know, I have a, a Bible study at my home every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And, you know, when the Lord, you know, told me to do this over 10 years ago, I didn't do it. I was disobedient. And what I did instead of starting this Bible study, I went back to school and got my master's degree in nursing. Well, that's lovely, but that's not what he told me to do. And when, he, when I was getting that degree, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I mean, I had struggles in that program. And, you know, I, 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 it took me up until maybe three years ago before I finally did what he told me to do. And it was a scary moment, too, because I knew that if I started that study, I'm going to have to study. At that study, that was going to take me up, um, um, up, up on another level. OK, and, and, and I was afraid of that. But knowing that I am in the right place and I'm doing his will and I'm doing what he told me to do, then I don't have any re reason to be to be nervous. Joshua, God told Joshua, look, you just do what I say and you have success. So Joshua went on and conquered the, con the, the, the villages, and he conquered the areas he needed to con conquer. Why? Because he knew that God is with him. And that's the same thing with us. You know, if you're young and you're still trying to figure out your, your, um, your career, you know, or you're, you're retired and you're trying to figure out what your next chapter is going to be, God has a plan for you. And once he gives you that plan, you have nothing to worry about. So this is not about being a strong black woman, all right? His strength is like no, no other. His strength is a strength that can, can sustain you in the time of trouble. His strength is what you need. And when you don't have to worry about a thing, it is very easy. You could almost tell when people are doing something that God told them to do versus something that God told them not to do. I've seen many people struggle in the faith, struggle in the word, trying to make something happen. But you know what? God didn't tell them to do it in the first place. That's the problem. OK, so once we know that we are grounded in the word, we're walking with our calm demeanor and our quiet spirit, we, he'll give us all the strength that he needs. 
all the strength that we need. Um, so our next point, be relentless in, in prayer and intercession. So we should always pray about all things. Prayer is our special communication. Prayer is our special way that we communicate with God. And you know, prayer is not a one-way street. Prayer does not is not where you sit and give your list of things to God. Okay, I want this, 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 and this. This is where you ask God, you want me to do something, but I don't know how to do it. You tell me how to do it. Or you ask God about yourself. How can you change yourself? And then you have to sit and listen for a response. A lot of times we get up and we're, we're, we're praying and we're just praying and we're gone. And we're not trying to consider what God has said, but we have to always understand that every area of our life is significant to him. Everything that you're going through is significant to him. Ever since he put Adam in the Garden of Eden, all God has wanted was someone to fellowship with. And ever since Eve messed up, this it with this sin nature. When Jesus came, God has been trying to get us back to this fellowship. He wants to talk to us. How do you have a friend that you don't talk to every day? I have friends that, I mean, I talk to them almost daily. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about them. You know, uh, what you're doing today? You know, I mean, God wants that type of communication with us. And that type of communication cannot happen only on Sunday morning. Oh, not only through prayer and praise, but that same prayer and praise feeling you get on Sunday morning, you should be able to get it in your living room on Monday morning where you are communing with the Father. You're communing with him daily. All right. And that is with prayer and intercession. Nothing in our lives is significant to him. The more we lean on him, the more we learn about him. Um, when we look at Thessalonians 5.17, it says to pray without ceasing. So Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about everything that's going on. What this godly life? So when he says pray without ceasing, that's exactly what it means. Pray without ceasing. You may say, well, how am I going to pray 24 hours a day? I got to put some food in my mouth, I got to go to work, I got to go to school, but in your mind, it's always a thank you, Jesus, in my mind. There's always, you know, walk with me, Lord. There's always a, a hymn that I'm singing. I want to stay on this continual line with God that I am communing with him uh, consistently. Why? Because I need to get keep myself straight because I mess up. I don't trust myself to make decisions because I made decisions before and decisions were horrible. So I don't trust myself. That's why even when I got married, you know, up until the day before I got married, decisions, I didn't want myself to get involved in something that I wasn't supposed to be involved in. So I tell everybody, and it sounds strange, but I married my husband in faith. I married him in faith that I was doing the right thing because I did not have any any faith in my own thinking, in my own judgment. And so I, I, I held God's hand and walked down that aisle, all right? So we have to pray without ceasing. All right, let's go. And we have to be relentless in that prayer. It, it makes me think of a Matthew 15, 21 through 28, when they were taught, when the woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to Jesus saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But Jesus didn't respond to her. And then the disciples came to him and said, well, you know what? Send her away. She's making noise and she's crying out after us. But but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, saying that I didn't come here to talk to the Gentiles. I only came here to talk to Israel. But this woman was relentless. She came to him and said, Lord, help me. 
And, she, and he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. When we're praying and interceding, we have to be relentless in our prayers, relentless when we're praying for our loved ones. We're praying for situations at work. We're praying for situations situation with our kids. When it says to pray constantly or pray without ceasing, that needs to be something that you are on God's coattail about this situation, about whatever is going on with your life. This woman wasn't even a Jew. And Jesus granted her 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 um, her request. So praying constantly be, be vigilant and relentless in your prayer life. The next one is impart wise, divide, wise advice, which I hope what I'm doing here. Um, in Proverbs 31, 26, it says, it says she opens her mouth with wisdom. So as a godly woman, foolishness shouldn't be coming out my mouth. I shouldn't be the one to start talking about other people. I should be either quiet or I should be imparting some wisdom to help you. But so often we see women, you know, godly women that are just always just kind of, um, you know, it, it makes me kind of ill, you know, when I see people that I attend church with and, you know, they, they can't find nothing good to say about the church I attend. They're, they're talking about it constantly, you know, so I have to avoid. What I do is I don't talk to those people. I avoid them because I'm not about that. There is so much work to be done in the kingdom. The fields are ripe with harvest and there's so much work that needs to be done that I really don't have time for the foolishness. I feel such an urgency in the gospel that I don't have time to be saying anything out my mouth that is really not worthy of what God would have me say. So all my energy has to be put towards the gospel. Psalms 1 one through six says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on, on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams season and his leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers the wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous so blessed is the man who does not sit in the council of the ungodly. And you know, as I was reading this, the Lord let me know that, you know, even though we're talking about the ungodly, we have some godly women that are acting like the ungodly. We, we should be imparting wisdom. We should not be the mess starters. We should be the peacekeepers. We should be the ones that's shutting it down. We should not carry on the tale. We should be ending it and giving some wisdom to the women that are talking. Um, I went to a, a conference this weekend with, with a lot of other nurses. And, you know, as we do when we get into these situations, the women are complaining about how something went. You know how we do. So, I mean, how I handled that, people will come up to me with something negative. I would just look at them and I say, God is in heaven. Hallelujah. And walk away. I wouldn't know what to say because I would not entertain what they're trying to bring to me. I don't have to, I don't have to, to, to deal with that. That is not important. You know, if somebody said hi to me, who cares? Perhaps they got something else on their mind. They didn't mention my name on the program. Okay, well, did you do it for your name to be mentioned? You're supposed to do your good works, drop the mic, and keep it pushing. You don't do stuff to get the reward of men. If you're looking for the reward of men, that's all you're going to get. I'm looking for the reward of God. I'm looking for a well done, my good and faithful servant, when I die. 
All right. So we have to always as women, godly women, be ready to impart wise advice and be quiet and shut down the foolishness and keep the peace and not carry the tale. I see too much of that on women that should know better. You know they know better, but you know we have itchy ears and a lot of us just love to hear it. Another thing we have to do is confess our faults. Now that is something that you know has been a um, a pet peeve for me in this walk that we have as Christians. The fact that people, and, and since I'm African American, I see it in the African American population where we don't share our faults. We will be going through hell, and nobody will know about it. Um, that is comes from something that is very old. Um, you know what your mother told you. Um, keep, you'll keep the business in the house. Don't share with anyone. But God has set up this system that we are supposed to be able to pray for each other, be able to lift each other up. Well, how do I know how to pray for you if you can't confess what's going on in with me? So it is something that if I understand that God has got my back, that if I share what has happened, I'm going to get a blessing because I'm going to be able to be prayed for by my sister. And my sister's going to be blessed because I shared with her and she's going to pray for me. So you see how holding everything in kind of shuts everybody out? You know, the system can't work the way it's supposed to work. So, you know, I, 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 I am open to sharing the things that I've done wrong, to sharing my life and the, where I've gone wrong so you can see the blessing of where I am today. And if a woman brought something serious to me, I would pray for her while keeping her confidence. But a lot of times the people that don't want to tell their business is the very one that will tell your business if you tell them. So we're supposed to be able to confess our faults. Well, you know, Joanne, you know, you got it all together and, you know, you're this and you're that. And every time I see you have a nice outfit on and you get over to church all the time. But, you know, that means nothing. That doesn't tell you what's in my heart. That's only the outside man that you see. You don't see what's going on on the inside of us. So if we confess. John 1 9 says, if we confess our, our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. James 5 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great so imagine, you know, you have an issue with a sexual addiction, you have an issue with drugs, you have an issue with gossiping, you have a hit, hit, an issue with anything. If you take it to your sister, your sister in Christ, and she joins with you and prays with you on that issue, there is power. to let each other know what's going on with us so we can pray and we can be stronger because the big picture is a great assignment is to tell others about the gospel and if you cannot do that then you're not able to be used by God because you're all bound up in your sin. But if you take that sin and you confess it to God and take it to your sister in Christ and you both pray on it, you are, you are, are being freed. Satan has no more hold on you because not only are you praying, your friend is praying for you. And you know, Satan is, is man, he loves to isolate you. He loves to make you think that you have the only one in the world. And as you share it, you'll find that other people also have that problem too. I'll never forget it. At my former church, a woman there uh, shared uh, experience that she had an abortion. And in her testimony, she was married. 
And she says, you know, they, she just didn't think that, um, that her and her husband could make it if they had another child. But as she's older now, she knows now that she would have made it. And the fact that she had, had confessed that, Help me out so much. And you know what? I didn't go back and tell her that I had also had an abortion and it also looked at, looked at that type of guilt and things that are going on. But just by her sharing that and confessing that fault with me in the audience, I don't know how many other women she reached, but it sure helped me. And I will never, ever forget it. I remember it just like it happened yesterday. So, you know, we have to be able to take a hit for the Lord. If I share something and somebody takes it and runs with it, God still gets the glory. All glory goes to God. He gives us brand new mercies day by day. Every day I mess up. The next morning I can get up and it's a brand new mercy. It's like the slate is being wiped clean. So I can move on, you know, but we have to be able to get comfortable enough and not trust our friends. See, and that's another mistake that we make. We think we have to trust our friend, but we trust God. to guard that. But I tell you, the most powerful, the most powerful testimonies are those are for people that have gone through something because we look at them and says, oh, my God, if they can go through this and look at them now that I know God is no respecter of person and I can do the same thing. All right. Now, my next point is exercise lightheartedness and good humor. Um, Proverbs 17.22 says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. And that is so true. Sometimes we can be so holy that we can't, we no good to nobody else. We can't laugh. There's nothing funny. We can't joke in the word. We can't do anything. But another characteristic of a godly woman is that she doesn't take herself too seriously. Okay? You can be godly and still go over there and dance. Right, Donna Whitfield? You can have a good time and, and, and the next day get up and preach a sermon because God is not a God of oppression. You know, that old oppressive spirit that, that used to be back in the day in some of these churches, oh my goodness, you couldn't, you couldn't smile, you couldn't laugh, there was nothing funny. But Proverbs 17, 22 says that a merry heart does good, like medicine. And says that a broken spirit dries the bones. A broken spirit dries your bones. Be happy. You should be happy anyway. Christ died on the cross for your sins and saved you from eternal damnation. Oh my gosh. You should be up on your feet. You should be praising God in the church. Nobody should be praising God for you. But just based on what he did for you. All right. So so get over yourself. It is not that serious. All right. So lighthearted, good humor. You should be the one that when the people want to be around you. Why? Because you're funny. People be around, want to be around you. Why? Because you always got a smile on your face and you're pleasant. That's the kind of woman that we should strive to be. Um, the next one should be, you know, no, no matter what we're doing, we should ask ourselves, and I hate to sound so like cliche, but literally, what would Jesus do? Is this something that I'm doing? Is this unto God? What am I doing? If I'm going to do a Bible study for him, I need to do my homework. I've been on the computer all day, just fixing and refixing and reformatting things so I can have something decent to give because I honor God. I don't want to get up here and, and just throw some stuff at you, you know, when God has given me this opportunity, you know, because it's a gigantic opportunity. Ten says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. So you're going to be dead. So you might as well, if you're going to do it, do it all the way. You're doing it for Christ and everything you're doing should be for Christ because you're going to die anyway. So if you're spending your time on things that are not serving the kingdom, I would question myself. I would look at, if I were you, I would look at my life and say, what am I doing in my life? What am I doing that 
that that it, is it bringing any glory to God or is it bringing glory to me? So you have to examine yourself and then whatever you're doing, you need to do it with all your might. And, you know, it just dawned on me. I didn't open the prayer and I apologize for that, but I'm going to pray double hard after we're done. The, la the, the next one, forgive as easily as you are forgiven. Colossians 3.13 says, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, people holding grudges, and they just cannot forgive. They can't get over it. And they're walking around with this situation in their life, and it's just wearing them down. I know I had a situation where um, um, I had a, uh, some work being done in my house, and the guy just kind of disappeared on me, took my money and disappeared. And I was so angry about that. I just, every time I thought about it, my stomach boiled. It just was horrible. And I remember I went to church and I asked my pastor, I said, well, you know, how do you forgive things that are just that deep? And he says, you know, you just got to pray. You know, so I started praying for that person. And I don't know what happened to him today. But I know one thing, I'm free. And that's what it is. Because when you, you allow somebody to sit up in your head, they're, 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 you're letting them rent space in your brain when you're supposed to be doing something else for God. But because Satan has you holding that grudge, you can't go forward. God is not going to use you when you got ought against your brother. You have to be able to let it go. And then also when I see people that won't forgive, it just, it, 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 it knocks me out because did Christ not forgive you by dying on the cross? How dare I have issue with anybody? Hell, I should be going directly to hell. Do not pass gold. Do not collect $200. Fast track. But because of what Jesus did for me, because of what Jesus did for me and saving my life for restoring me in situation after situation after situation, time and time again, how dare I not forgive? I cannot function with unforgiveness in my heart. So that's why sometimes I, I even will ask for someone's forgiveness or forgive them even when I know good and well they are the one that is in the wrong. But so I can continue my life and my track with, the, with, the, with God, I have to forgive him. Because that's going to blow. How can I get on my knees and, and pray for anything? How can I go to church and raise my hand in prayer and praise when I know I got this issue with this person? I got to be clean. I got to be clear. I got to be straight so that God can continue to use me the way he sees fit. So, you know, a godly woman forgives as easily. No matter what happened to you, no matter what happened to us, be it financial abuse, be it sexual abuse, be it your mother gave you up for adoption, all the horrible things that could have happened to you. You were not crucified on the cross. And in order for us to be able to move forward, we have to be able to forgive. God cannot use us. How dare we hold a grudge? How dare we hold a grudge? Now, I think that was my last point. Uh, yes, forgive as you forgive it. Um, now, at this time, if let me read some of the comments to see. Um, Okay, share my video on the timeline. Okay, I, I love, thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, for me to, you know, I, I'm a nurse and I'm a retired nurse and I worked for Kaiser Permanente here in Los Angeles for 25 years and they laid me off. And, you know, at the time I couldn't believe it. I got a really good severance package though and I stayed home for six months. And, um, you know, then I thought, not, not the Lord didn't tell me to do this. I thought, oh, I should be working. 
So let me go back to work. So I went and found this job that was all the way in North Hollywood. It's about an hour from me. The drive was horrible. The people I had to work with were horrible. And I think I, I managed to hang in there for two years before I finally stopped. And the Lord told me, I've been trying to set you down since 2012. So I, I've sat down now. I, I fully retired and, and I'm doing his work and I'm doing what he would have me do, you know, but still, I'm not 100 percent sure where it's all going. All I can do is day by day. So let me just give you this. If you are not sure where God wants you to be and he does want you to be somewhere. But how do you find that out? By studying his word by praying and communing with him. He has something for you to do. And it may be something out of your comfort zone, you know, because I mean, I made pretty good money as a nurse executive. And for me, like maybe 75% of what I was making was not an easy thing, but that's why I got to stay straight with God. Because once I start looking at the numbers, I'll start to sink. But I call it my walking on water lifestyle. You know, I don't look left nor right. I only look above because if I look down at really what's happening, I don't get it. I don't get the whole thing. But that's why my faith is in him. You know, I look at that husband that's back there right now. I don't get the whole thing. But God has ordained this and I'm walking by faith. So when you are in his will, when you are walking along with his will, your step should feel a little unsure. Why? Because you're walking in faith. Just like Peter walking on the water along with Christ, he was all right till he looked down. So I try not to look down, I look up. And this has been a pleasure and I've enjoyed this so much and I'm gonna be back next week um, talking about a topic. Um, can't remember it right offhand, but I'll be back here at five o'clock. And um, please share with your friends, add your single friends into this group, you know, so they can hear it. And the video is going to be posted. So if anybody missed it, you can go back and play it. And so now I will close us in prayer. Father God, first of all, I ask your forgiveness for not starting out your word, but I'm kind of in communion with you the whole time. I, I guess that's why I didn't think about it. But Father, I thank you for the word that you put forth, Father God. I thank you that you had the people on the line, what you're saying, Lord God. And I just lift up the hundreds of people that are going to hear this message, Father God. I thank you, Lord, for using me. I thank you, Lord, for, for, for preparing us to do your work, Father God. We thank you for the insight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that is here to guide us into all understanding. Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent to die for my sins, Father God. And I'm so grateful for that. I thank you for that so much, Lord, that I don't have to die, Father God, but I'm gonna live eternally with you. Father God, I lift up all the women that are on the line right now, Father God. You know what's going on in each one of their lives. You know what's going on. You you know what they need. You know what they're weak in, Father God. I ask you, Lord, to lift them right now. I ask you, Lord, to, to, to feel that need right now, Father God. And Lord, I ask you just to lift up Zandra. And I thank you for, I thank her for being obedient to your word, Father God. Father God, we just thank you and we praise you as a God who is above all things, Father God, the one that understands everything, the one who has every answer, the one who has all the riches, Father God, and you take care of us day by day. In his name, amen. All right, ladies, and, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.